hello and welcome back to season two of Dream Girl. Today, my guest is Courtney Daniela Boateng. And Courtney is a content creator and entrepreneur passionate about seeing women achieve ambitious dreams through the power of transparency and community. She's the founder of the e-commerce beauty brand CDB London and co-founder of the fastest growing digital sisterhood to my sisters. And Courtney's work aims to create opportunities for the wellness, growth and development of women globally. Hi, Courtney. How are you today? Hello. I am well, thank you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm team? good. It, it was raining the whole week and yesterday, but today's sunny, so I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a gloomy week. I know, yeah. but horrible. Yeah, where are you joining us from? London. London, North London yeah. specifically, my my home. Oh town. nice. Are you excited <laughs> for tomorrow when lockdown lifts? <laughs> oh, I I am so excited. Like I was on um this uh, view cinema oh, no. app yesterday, and I was like scrolling through. I'm like, how many tickets can I book? Like to just be at the cinema all day. I have just missed the cinema wow. mainly and dining in. Like I used to have a thing at least like once, but cheekily it used to be like twice a week. I'll take myself on like a solo oh, date, nice. um, and I go yeah. So like I go to a restaurant and then I go to the cinema oh. after, and it just used to be the most relaxing thing. But obviously, since lockdown has closed the cinema and like closed restaurants I haven't been able to do it and like I know everyone's like oh you can have a not movie now at home, at home no. is not the same I don't want to be around anybody <laughs> like I just want to go and you know, be in the big screen with like the bass and stuff so I am so I mean if you are looking for me tomorrow and this week I'm probably in a cinema wait do they somewhere. have new movies out this is the problem no <laughs> so they are showing um the movies that are you know available up the best ah. but i think i'm just gonna that go with just the euphoria of being yeah. in a cinema <laughs> it's yeah so i'm gonna be watching like kiddie films nice. like it's not like cartoon yeah. films so, <laughs> you know... it's like, but they're they're showing reruns though of like old films like mortal Kombat. okay well let me share a story with you when i went to the cinema on my own because i thought yes, you know please. i'm an independent woman i'm gonna take myself to the cinema i didn't have any movie in <laughs> mind to go see and then the one I picked okay. was called This Is The End. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like a parody of a world ending movie. Oh, and wow, it was okay, so okay. bad. And I just remember being sad there. I was like, even this popcorn tastes bad because of how bad this movie is. And I was like, never again. <laughs> no no you can't you, especially because when you go into a cinema screen you feel like you have to commit yeah. something about like as soon as the lights turn off you realize i'm in this for the next couple I'm hours like i can't really leave i'm, tra I'm trapped so, so when the movie is bad it's like where do we go from here i've got to, i paid for this stuff i've got to stay yeah okay so, you know you've yeah. given me an idea i feel like it might be too late now probably a lot of people already booked but i'm going to try and book something this week mm. I, and you know in do cambridge it. there's do the it. view where you have the reclining seats this is just heaven. I miss it so much. <laughs> I miss it so much. And the thing is, I discovered it so late. No. I discovered it towards the end oh, of no. my third year. Yeah. So literally, everyone's been talking about it. And I'm used to going to the picture house, Oh, right? no. You, um, you did it Which wrong. is like an old yeah. school. Yeah. <laughs> like, old school is, is not that great. But they show good films, though, like indie films. But um, I, I went to The View and I was like, this place is the creme de la creme of cinemas yeah when i and i saw all views were like this because i'm i'm when i'm back home i'm a cine right girl, right so then i came back home and there's a, a view near me and i decided to venture out you know tickets cost around the same price went there enter into the screen i'm thinking this is not what I why is it not reclining <laughs> where are the recliners <laughs> <laughs> where are the recliners i'm even sitting in the vip i'm like there's no no <laughs> recline, you know, <laughs> terrible stuff. So now I, I've actually even considered going all the way to just Cambridge to watch a movie for like a day trip just to watch a film. I, I do it. I do it. <laughs> oh wow, terrible. Love it. But also speaking of Cambridge, do you miss it? How long has it been yeah. since you left? Three oh, years, nearly three nice. years. This this June, yeah. So it's been a, a while. Um, it's flown by though. I do I miss Cambridge some things mm. yes I do um I think the city is beautiful like the cinema I miss that every day um but also certain things like being around yes. friends um and and that kind of you know feeling of 
yeah, these are my uni days, but then the workload, the intensity, <laughs> the anxiety, I would rather leave that. I part. agree. Yeah. I agree. I love it. I think this is, I, I love how every time you talk to anyone who's been to Oxbridge, this is exactly what you get. Oh yeah, love mm. the place, love the people. The actual university days, not really. <laughs> The degree, <laughs> they, they could keep that. <laughs> so what did you study at Cambridge? I studied uh, human, social and political Ooh, sciences. Oh, how did you find that? Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. So I specialised in sociology mm-hmm. um, with social psychology. So every year I took a module from the psychology and behavioural studies mm-hmm. department. And um, I loved my course. I really loved the things that we were exploring. I've always loved sociology mm-hmm. um, since GCSEs. So exploring it at a higher level, having certain, you know, conversations um, about media, race, gender, education, like all these things really fascinated mm-hmm. me. And um, obviously with HSPS, it's a bit different because it's like intertwined mm-hmm. with politics and um, understanding human behavior. So I I thoroughly enjoyed it. The workload, though, was <laughs> to, with any Cambridge degree, like I think they don't prepare mm. you enough for just how much work you're going to be doing in terms of the reading, the writing, the supervisions and how intense that's going to be whilst trying to have, you know, mm-hmm. a life outside of your studies. I think that that is it's like understated how intense it can be when you're there. And I think coming from a state school background as well, it just felt very mm-hmm. difficult it, and it felt very different. So I, I it took me a while mm-hmm. to adjust. And once I did adjust, it was like, okay, I can do this. But then like a week later I graduated. So it was way too late. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, you know, yeah. um, when I started Oxford, I remember just seeing how there was no black people in my college in my first year being mm. there and what we, college were you at i was at corpus christi at oxford okay yeah okay. and then um when i got here again in my department there were no black people and it's something i noticed right because mm. i'm from mauritius and i'm surrounded by people of different colors all the time and then coming here seeing yeah. that there was no one you always think but what what's happening right so i always get excited when i see people of color because in my department there's yeah. just me and, other, and another person who is brown and we always get mm-hmm. confused to be the mm-hmm. same people think we're the same person <laughs> just because we're both brown and i was just telling you right now how one time cambridge <laughs> university shared a photo of you on the instagram and four people told me oh sheen you're on the instagram of cambridge and i was like why like this is brown <laughs> this is black <laughs> this is black <laughs> we are different people <laughs> different people and it's 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 crazy because those kind of yeah. mistakes happen all the time well not all the time but they they happen too yeah. often um to be okay and i think it's something that you don't really know how to engage with it when it happens to you like it never becomes you never get used to it and I think that that's one of the most uncomfortable things about it because you're thinking like, surely you didn't truly mm. believe that. Like, how can you make this mistake? And why do you think we, we like all ethnic minorities kind of look the same and can just be, you know, co- co- conflated yeah. with each other? That's not the case. Like, we all have distinct faces and we're human beings it doesn't it, like why do we even need to explain this it's, just, it's, it's such it's one of the most weird things yeah. to me, like when someone's like oh you look like this person like, that person is of a different race <laughs> a different shade different hair different, everything is different where are you pulling this yeah from? where where what are you seeing <laughs> other than we're not white what exactly what are you seeing <laughs> please and i i know exactly the post you're referring to in that thumbnail i look nothing <laughs> like <laughs> you I'm just and i have long hair and you had such short hair in that photo i was like where did you see that and also i'm like when you're looking at a photo that's tagged surely you can tell it's not me you can't even blame it on oh i just glanced at it and oh it's terrible it's so terrible so so tell me what was your experience of being you know a young black woman in cambridge yeah uh it was Hmm. interesting i think Whilst I was actually on campus and in university, I think uh, it was mainly like the in- internal kind of imposter yeah. syndrome that made me uncomfortable initially. Um, I, I, like I said, coming from a state school um, in a like very ethnically diverse mm-hmm. background and, and area, 
it was very different being in that space. Um, and I felt a, a huge amount like I just didn't belong. And the more I started to kind of reject that idea and kind of set that weight off my shoulders, um, I started to get more integrated in my college and the university and just finding friends and, you know, joining the African Caribbean Society was a huge part of my mm. journey and just, you know, building relationships. Um, and I found that actually on campus, it wasn't that bad. There were those microaggressions, yeah. you know, here and there. I remember walking into certain colleges and, you know, you're you're walking in maybe to go and see a friend and then you're getting heckled back, you know, like come back me, to the me, to the porter's lodge. Me. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Like people have walked in and I mean, not just people, strangers, like people off the street just come into view colleges as tourists. And I'm the one who's being heckled back. Like, excuse me, excuse me. Can we uh, see your yeah. ID, like your card? And I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. Why? And, you know, oh, we just, you know, we, we haven't seen you and, you know, or being similarly being mistaken for somebody else and people having full blown conversations with you to your face. And then you being like, I don't, I don't think I'm the person <laughs> you think I am. <laughs> so I'm just going to walk <clears throat> away and let you sit yep. with that because I have no idea yeah. what's going on or, um, you know, just having people be shocked that you even go mm. to Cambridge. People in Cambridge shocked oh, that yeah. you go to Cambridge and being mistaken for going to Anglia Ruskin or something like that. And it's like, you know, you kind of learn to live with that. But I think for me, what was even what was worse was people outside of the university invalidated my belonging more than people in really? the university, if that wow. makes sense. So yeah, so like on social media and particularly on YouTube, I started my YouTube channel quite early into my degree. So in first year and myself and um, Renee, uh, who is, you know, my co-host, co-founder, yeah. best friend with two of my sisters. Um, she was at Oxford at the same time, but when she came to Cambridge to visit me, we recorded a video about how we got into Oxford and Cambridge. And it was basically just giving advice that we wish mm. we had had when we were in, <laughs> year you know 12 year 13 applying and so many people are in those comments like how did these two how did these two get into Oxford and Cambridge this is a great um example of how like their standards are like going wow. down and like declining um they definitely got in by affirmative action wow. there's no way they got the grades there's no, there's no way they're smart enough look at listen to the way that they're talking and I had people literally in there like I didn't get in or my son didn't get in or my daughter didn't get in and they gave their places to people like oh. you, you know, out of diverse, literally out of diversity. Oh, you're just a quota. And you're the reason yeah. why. You're okay. just a quota, right? And and you're the reason why they didn't get in, despite the fact our grades are listed there <laughs> on the screen. Oh, we like, don't these see are that. Like, yeah, we're yeah. smart. <laughs> we, we, we got in um, on merit. And so it, I think that was the hardest thing for me, just knowing people's perception was that I don't mm. belong here. There's no way I could have earned this. And I, I think it got me quite a bit of press coverage as well because I, I had to kind of, I was really bugged by this narrative of luck. You're there because you're lucky. You're there because somebody, you know, took pity mm. on you almost, you know, this, mm. this young black girl, North London, uh, council estate, like all of that, people took pity on you. And that's why you're here rather than, I have worked hard being powered by my mm. background and being empowered from my background to mm -hmm. be here. And people didn't want to give mm. that credit to myself and Renee. And so I think that was the toughest part of my experience at Cambridge. It wasn't even people yeah. in Cambridge. It was the world's perception of Oh, it. that's horrible. And, um, you know, yeah. I can relate with this now because I also started YouTube, right? And I did a video about why I did mm. a PhD at Cambridge. And someone yeah. commented, you don't even sound smart. I was like, yeah. rude. <laughs> I've had that so many times. <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean I don't sound Literally, right? Literally. Is that what you're trying to you're say? Like, what, what does that yeah. mean? Um, and I think I think that that's it. Is, it all comes around the the idea, the ideas, and the archetypes people have towards mm. what a Cambridge student should be, what a PhD mm. student should be, and oftentimes people that look like us, people who sound like us, don't fit that mold. Um, and that's why it's amazing when you do have a video like um, yours where you're saying, you know, why I did a PhD at Cambridge, and people see that and realize that the mold doesn't look mm. like how they may have thought. And I think it's encouraging for so mm. many people, but for a lot of people, unfortunately, it really ruffles <laughs> their feathers. Um, it does, because it, it completely shatters uh, maybe something that they're holding onto as 
um, something that's valuable to mm. them, you know, like those people who were in my comments talking about my son didn't get in, they probably told themselves, um, the they lie they told themselves is my son yeah. couldn't get in exactly that and now I'm mm. the reason you know I am I'm a great place for them to pour mm. out their frustrations mm. um and I started to realize I don't have to take that I'm here I'm doing my degree in fact I'm yeah. stressed enough <laughs> like, for me to now be taking well, on your insecurities you no thanks I'm okay yeah. you know <laughs> like, funny story there's this that. um there's this lady who works for the university who found out mm. I was from Mauritius and then she wanted to have a chat with me and I was like, oh, mm-hmm. nice. She probably has some links with Mauritius. And then she was telling me how her dad was one of the latest people who were the colonizers of Mauritius. So they were the ones who gave Mauritius the, their independence and they were the last one to leave. And I was like, OK, cool. And then she was like, um, so do you study here? <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, she was like, OK. It's she was like, did you do your first degree in Mauritius? I was like, no, it was at Oxford and now I'm doing a PhD. Mm. And she was like, oh, I didn't know you people made it to Oxbridge. <laughs> I was like, what do I say to this? Sometimes you have to tell people about themselves. <laughs> right. you, you can't, you can't, that's, that's, no, because people will look at you like, dead in the face and completely yeah. make you feel like, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not meant to be here. And that is so, it's so shocking as well. You don't know what ignorance. to say. You're just there like. It's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like, and it, you're just, you're stunned. Yeah. You're literally yeah. stunned that somebody can say, but then you think it's t- the 21st century. And she works for the university. <laughs> and I was like. And that that's even, that, that's even more like yeah. problematic because you these are the people who kind of you know safeguard Mm. they're the gatekeepers of the university right and they're the ones who are meant to set example and also bring in change and if their mindsets aren't changed you wonder how how fast can the university Mm. progress i think cambridge particularly has made massive strides in terms of improving diversity improving um kind of that 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 thing that they were lacking um in terms of the ideas around what a Cambridge mm. student should look like but they're still so far to go and if you can then meet someone in recent times who is still possessing that kind of mindset yeah. that is extremely ignorant you wonder how fast do you because a lot of the times it's the students doing yeah. the work you know it's the influence it's yeah. people like you it's people who are creating the content to show here's the mm. representation that the mainstream press is not showing yeah. Um, and then when the the university itself is showing their backside, you're thinking this is so this is so annoying. It's just, it's just <laughs> we're trying to improve things. You're like, I'm here to try and make it more inclusive, and I just keep getting kicked you in know? the teeth every time. Yeah, you keep embarrassing yeah. me. It's you're like, it. we should be in this together. Come on. <laughs> keep up. But yeah, oh, it's incredible. I just see you win. And, and it, it's nice to find other people who can relate with you on these things, but then it makes me more sad because mm. it means a lot of people are experiencing this. It's uh, common, how, yeah. how do we move away yeah. from this? And you're right, like the university is actively trying to solve all of this, but I feel like there's a big disconnect between the university understanding mm. what the real problem is, where the gap is, and how to really mm. cover that, which is what we are doing because we, yeah. we've been on the field, exactly. you know what's happening. And yeah yeah it's incredible which is why they you know every time when it comes to the outreach conversation right of why why Mm. is there so few black people why are minorities not really Mm. involved in the university and it's always like oh maybe they don't apply Mm, let's look at the stats (laughs) yeah yeah exactly and and even if it is because like they don't apply why are we doing about that because yeah. clearly it's something yeah. about you exactly it's, it's not about them it's clearly something about the way you're presenting so I, I completely agree I think it's getting to the root issues and statistics can sometimes can only tell you so mm. much there's so there's such an importance of lived experience and taking time to listen to students mm. in and outside of the university about their feelings and their perceptions mm. about the university and the campus and the, what their experience would be like there is super important. And that's why I think the university can't do it on its own. I think they hugely need um, to listen to the students mm-hmm. about what it is that needs to be changed and also work with them to enact that Absolutely. Change. Is that why you started your YouTube channel? I actually started my YouTube channel for a different Mm. reason. Interestingly enough, if you watch like the first, I think like the first 10 videos on my channel, 
I didn't mention once that yeah, I went you to didn't. Cambridge University. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I remember a friend asked me, she's like, so on your YouTube channel, you never <laughs> mentioned that you went to yeah. Cambridge. And I was like, because that's not really why I started it. The reason why I started my channel was I was having conversations with mm. friends, um, similar to what I have now with Renee mm. on the podcast, but we were just having conversations, relationships, family, trauma, healing, faith, all of those things. And we would all start to realize we have so much common ground in what we're trying to figure out in this season of our lives. Like we're all coming of age, we're 18, 19 years old. We all have the same insecurities and fears and we're, we're coming from such different backgrounds and yet we're still here with the same you know, mm-hmm. feelings. And why are people not sharing these parts? And I started to realize it's because it's really hard to be transparent when you're in environments or you're coming from a place where people expect so much from you. And so I thought, you know what? I think what ushers in these conversations is just one person's transparency. Mm. And so I decided to start my YouTube channel because of that. I said, okay, if no one's gonna have the conversations, I'll start the conversation Mm -hmm. and then see what other people think and create kind of this, this community and this space for people to just be honest and to think about, you know, things they may not be thinking about. And that's what my channel started at. So I was talking about like friendships, relationships. Um, And at the same time, my love for beauty at the time I had just, you know, finished my uh, second job as a hairstylist. So my love for beauty also like, I wanted to translate that um, because I wasn't able to take hair appointments whilst I was studying. So that's how my YouTube channel started. Nice. And how has that journey been for you? Because I recently started, right? And I can tell you that for me, it's like one week I'm like, oh, I love this. Next is like, I should just quit this. <laughs> That's me till this day. Like the, the yeah, turbulence is real. real. Trust me, I'm there with you. Um, I, I've always had a love relationship with YouTube as a viewer mm. and as a creator. Um, I think it's it has been a difficult journey because as time goes on, as you grow and as you develop, you know, there's always that thing people hammer on, like find a niche. And I've always struggled with that because like I said, a lot of the conversations I wanted to have were around what is happening in my life right now that I want to share, like an online diary. And because that changes all the time, um, people may have come to you in one season for something and subscribed, but now you're in a different place and you want to make content that's in a different place. And it's like, you're disengaging your audience all the time. Um, and so I always struggled to understand where do I fit in this YouTube space? You know, it would be so much easier if I was just a makeup channel or a Mm -hmm. hair channel, but I'm here talking about like life issues, which change all the time. Um, and so I think with that, I sometimes got discouraged because I gained a lot of followers who were following me because of, you know, my year in um, Cambridge Mm -hmm. reviews and like, you know, my second year review, second, third year review and all of those things. And loads of people who followed because of mine and Renee's Mm -hmm. video. But then, you know, you would subscribe and then the next week (laughs) I'm talking about like my breakup and like, here's a story time about my my cheating ex. Like all of these different things. It was so, it was just so all over the place and I struggled to find my identity. And I think now I'm becoming more Mm -hmm. at peace with the fact that that's just who I am and my channel really is a diary like it really is a log of my journey and I want people to do their journey alongside me um but I might ever I might not ever find a niche and so I came up with this thing where I was like I am the niche that's, that's it me. like I can't, <laughs> can't tell you it's yeah. just me ask me what the niche the category is Courtney Daniela yeah. Bonting. I, I don't know what to tell you so um embracing that has made me more confident to now do content now it's just about finding the schedule Find Funny enough, I was more organized whilst I was at university. Um, now it's just a bit like, where do mm. I find the time? Um, but my journey, mm. I've loved it. Like I, I would highly recommend to anybody who wants to start a channel mm-hmm. to start it. Yeah, I agree with you entirely on that. And on the niche thing, this is very interesting because I've also been struggling with this. I started with the idea mm. of doing just video podcast and then um, I was told that, oh, people won't watch one hour long videos, so you should make shorter videos. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do like little ones, but it's the mm. same as you. I want to do vlog, a bit of lifestyle. You know, I want to yeah. do some random stuff talking about education. And then I want to talk, do mm. just, you know, a funny video. And I, I don't find a niche. I'm clearly not defined by a niche in any way. And this is something I've been talking to a lot of female creators with. And I think this is more mm. of a female problem because we are so interested and so talented in so many things it's hard to pick one and be like this is going to be my niche and um, to find an umbrella that kind of captures everything together is very hard and I think you are so Mm. right with the well the umbrella is me (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I do actually think I don't know what to tell you here. <laughs> it's literally, I think I think though one thing that is cool sometimes is if you can have like a not a theme, but something that threads mm. through. So even if it's the style yeah. of content, if as long as that's kind of consistent or mm-hmm. similar, people can kind of get with mm-hmm. it. You know, it doesn't feel too all over the place. But at the same time, I also think it's important as a creator to just explore what you're mm. passionate about. And I think you're at, at a point, you'll just find, you'll land mm. somewhere. Um, and I think it's important to not have any regrets and just try mm-hmm. out things. And maybe it does hinder your growth, but at the end of the day, at least you've expressed yeah. yourself and you've grown in a different way. It might not be subscriber mm-hmm. count. It might not be engagement, but it is in mm-hmm. creativity, you know, and that sometimes that's equally, if not more important. Than oh yeah, hundred percent agree on that. And I feel like experimenting is so important as well, because even I don't yeah. know what I want to do and what I like. So just trying different things. Mm. But you know what frustrates me is when you put in so much time mm-hmm. to do a very well scripted educational video. And then people are like, okay, this is all right. But then I do a vlog about a random day in my life and people love it. <laughs> and you're like, but this is boring. Yeah, it's got is- no educational value. <laughs> That is the world of content. Like that is actually the world of content. You'll pour your heart into something. People will be like, yeah, cool. one like <laughs> next, whatever. <laughs> pat, pat, pat. Um, next. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So tell me, after university, what was your path? Mm. What did you think? Where did you go professionally? Yeah. So I jumped straight into entrepreneurship. I decided that's to start great. my own hair company. Oh wow. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> that was literally like a week after Mm -hmm. I graduated I was like yeah let me just start my brand and um I did I actually I think yeah literally like a week after my graduation I registered my company and um I've been doing that since and yeah YouTube creation here and there so what 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 was the process for you so I suppose you already had the idea what Mm. you what you need and you knew what you wanted to do yeah yeah so I worked at a um a hair company a Mm -hmm. startup as a business development associate on and off whilst I was mm-hmm. at university. So during like holiday times and it was amazing to me. I absolutely loved it. I loved the team and I loved being in a different position um, within the hair mm-hmm. industry. Cause I was so used to being a hairstylist mm-hmm. and I wanted something different. I wanted to, you know, put my business brain to use and my creativity mm. as well. And um, though I had like a full-time job offer from this company, I just thought, you know what, what better time than to just yeah. try it than now because I'm going home to live, you know, I'm going home to yeah. live with my parents. There's kind of a security yeah. blank- blanket there. So uh, I decided to just start my company and it was not easy because I didn't really know mm. what to do. So um, like, whereas the startup I was working in had like VC funding and all of that, it was just me at home. Yeah, you know, where do I start? Trying to yeah. figure it out. Where yeah. do I start? So this is where YouTube came into play hugely because I was like, Google how to set up a Shopify store and be watching tutorials mm-hmm. on that and be doing it side wow. by side. Um, having to learn how to take my own product pictures, organize shoots. I was doing all of that, all self-funded as well. So it was really stressful, um, but I think it taught me mm-hmm. so much. And I, I think I graduated in June and I registered in July, but my company didn't launch until August mm-hmm. 25th. So that's when it launched. Um, and nobody bought from me for like a, a solid yeah. one month. And I was oh, so I, upset. I can imagine. <laughs> so upset. Like, I was so upset. And the thing is, my friends and people around me were placing orders here and there. Um, but I thought my e-commerce store would be booming. <laughs> it was not. I was oh, broke. <laughs> like, um, and then I decided um, in October, like, to get us. My mum was basically telling me, like, you can't mm. do hair at home anymore. You can't make wigs at home. Oh, just to explain to what yeah, I do. Yeah, I was so, going to say, well, um, you make you make yeah, yeah, you so, <laughs> so my company sells yeah. hair extensions and mm-hmm. makes wigs, but the whole ethos is just hair made easy. So we're trying to um, make the whole experience of getting your hair done just an easy, smooth mm-hmm. experience uh, for, for the customer. So I would uh, create wigs, like the spoke oh, wow. wigs, according to the look that you wanted, um, coloring, all of that, just to make sure when you got it, it was exactly what you needed oh, wow. out of the box and you just put it on and you're good to go. So, so did you learn um, that while you were working we, as a hairstylist, how to do all of this? Okay. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. So I, I had been working as a hairstylist since I was mm-hmm. 14. Um, and so I was used to that right. I was a working girl <laughs> before I got to yeah. university. So I was, I was used to that. And 
my mum was just like, yeah, you can't do hair at home anymore. Cause I was making all the products in oh my bedroom my and I was like, you know, washing wigs in our sinks and like just the bathroom sink and hair. And my mum is like, oh, no. she was like, there's hair everywhere. You've like got bleach on oh. towels. The sink every week is blocked. We're having to like call the council. Be like, can you come and unblock our sink? And then when they do, they have to like pull out this massive pool of hair out of the box like she was she yeah. was livid she yeah. was not having it understandably fair enough, yeah you know? fair enough um so, so she was like yeah you're not either you get your own place or you've yeah. got to stop this um and I ended up getting a little shop on the high Aww. street in my local area yeah was that, was that a big um, feeling and I feel like for me it would be like big party massive <laughs> massive like it wasn't even a big party thing because I didn't have any money she <laughs> didn't have any money <laughs> even my friends were like oh you can no. have like a little you know ribbon no. Like, no, absolutely. who's got money for ribbon we're trying to stay alive guys we're trying to stay yeah. alive so <laughs> yeah I was like there's no party anything we just need to get mm. to work and it was just me at the time but as time has progressed over the last three years I've had you know, people I could train and they've come onto the team and they've gone on to start wow. their own things, even start their own companies. Um, and now I, I work with um, like a team that helps me manage the company and its marketing mm-hmm. and the content creation and stuff. But then I also have, you know, hairstylists who are do- making the products mm-hmm. themselves and it's a great stream of income for them. They've learned another skill, but a lot of them are doing this mm. on the side. So, you know, we have wig makers who are software developers, what? others who are students. Um, yeah, and they they mm. knew light in this, and it's it's great to offer people opportunity to do that while still offering you know great mm-hmm. hair extensions and great um, wigs to people. But it, it was definitely difficult, like not having funding, everything being like from your mm. own pocket has been super mm. tough. And it's only in the last one year that I've actually like taken a paycheck, which can be super tough, especially when you're graduating in a cohort of people who like work for the civil service have investment gone on to like you know yeah. investment <laughs> banking they're lawyers they're you know my my best friend did a master's yeah. at harvard and i'm just here like yeah i'm I just no trying money. to get this hair company yeah. like i have no money i've just got bundles you need a wig I've got that. <laughs> like, but i don't have anything yeah. else you know i don't have savings I, and i think that that was one of the biggest challenges as well like being you know 21 and or mm. 22 and seeing your friends doing well and then wondering will it happen? where are you where yeah. have you been at yeah. will it happen to me and on top of it why am I not using mm. my degree you know everyone's kind of looking at you like why you are, yeah. you've got this amazing yeah. degree um why are you we doing hair? hair and that's how yeah. I used to frame it you're doing hair like you're, you've gone back to being a hairdresser it's kind of like you you've regressed um but I had to kind of hold on to the long-term mm-hmm. aim of things and I think I'm I'm slowly getting towards that as well so it's been so a when did journey. you see the when did you see the tide change for you when it was starting off and then you were not having any sales interestingly the the tide okay I think it's been an, a steady like upwards mm. climb um since we got the first space that we had so it, in October 2018 mm-hmm. I got that space. Um, it was like a tiny place attached to a yeah. laundrette, but it was like my own little. And like when they were, <laughs> when they were drying clothes in the laundrette, all the heat would come into my studio. And so it's summer winter, was yeah. like lock off. <laughs> it's winter was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Didn't have any heating bills, but summer I couldn't do any clients because it was sweltering oh in God. there. Um, it was, it was, it was really dark. And even with that, like my, my landlord was like, yeah, I don't typically like to hire out my space to black women. They don't pay on time. <laughs> so the own, literally. I went through hell and high water to you get You should that write place. a book only place. about this. I should write. <laughs> Resilience. resilience oh my god every time i'm like if i'm writing a book it's gonna be about resilience <laughs> literally so uh yeah i ended up being in that space and he loved me of course you were end. paying like, on time weren't you? I, I was happy yeah exactly and i was i was happy to change that kind of thing in his mind but it was it was it was annoying so um i started to see because we now imp- we had um introduced a new service so on top of us getting the hair extensions, making the wig, coloring it and Mm. sending it to you, we could now install Mm. it on you. So you didn't even have to worry about like gluing Mm -hmm. it down and all those technicalities. Mm -hmm. We could do that for you in the the studio. Um, And I think that extra perk of it being included in the price made people realize this was amazing value for money. 
And so they just hopped on and sales started coming in and then with word of mouth and, you know, my social media mm -hmm. following kind of growing it as well, that has been massively helpful. But then the pandemic hit and we couldn't have a, any yeah. talent appointments anymore. Um, and that was really mm. tough. Like that, I was like this close to just shutting oh, it all damn. down. Um, and then, you know, I decided to give it one mm. more try and we rebranded new name, new logo, new packaging, everything. And we purely became e-commerce. And I think the middle of last year was when things skyrocketed. Like we were really pushing into like paid mm -hmm. advertisements, getting our name out there and demonstrating our product, you know, being more content focused and, that honestly, after two years, at that point, it had been two years, after two years of mm -hmm. pushing and pushing and pushing, that was when we felt a break, nice. like an actual good uh, like thing happened in the middle of a pandemic, Look which at you. was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so last year we moved to a bigger studio. We now have two mm -hmm. studios and I use this one for like creating and the other one has like a whole bunch of stock, just so many things that this time last year, I definitely wouldn't have imagined would happen happened and like we were saying like resilience really was a key thing in that oh that's so wonderful i love hearing these stories of like you know just being patient and consistent and just pushing yeah, and then yeah. you do see the result eventually right because hard work doesn't go wasted exactly. either way so exactly. that, that's, a good that's so, such a beautiful story mate i also i just <laughs> love the how now you have a studio you have a warehouse and everything like yeah. This is cool. And now you use your studio for content creation, which is also the podcast, right? Yes, yes, exactly, including the podcast. So um, it has been a great thing to not have. I mean, we started the podcast last mm -hmm. November, similar yeah. time to you. And um, we were just sitting on my bed, like in the corner <laughs> of my tiny bedroom. I had like clothes. Renee has been through a lot. Man, I, <laughs> I was like traveling. Every time I travel, I don't really unpack. It's I, just like, there. out of my suitcase, even if I come yeah. back home. So like, I just have clothes mounded up and I'm like, yeah, if you just like navigate around the clothes yeah. and just sit in this corner of my bed, we can yeah. record. <laughs> but that's all we had, you know, I had the equipment for, for a long mm. time. And I was like, yeah, let's just start a podcast. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. And we were sitting on my bed, just talking to each other, like bonnets on, like all this glam you see on the video. <laughs> like, on the my sisters, it's recent. Yeah. Like, that is because there's a camera now. Back then we were like, Yep. off under yep. the covers just talking to each other and it, it was a great humble <laughs> beginning um but yeah it didn't last long I mean we decided to implement video mm. podcasts um a couple months ago and because I have this studio it was it was a no-brainer we could do it in here um and we have been and we've seen so much growth and I think with YouTube what's so amazing with it as a platform is it reaches so yeah. many different people and you don't really have to do mm. much apart from put mm. out the content, you know, the algorithm kind of works, works it for you. And the growth we've been seeing, the amazing women we've been able to reach all over the world. I mean, we were having listeners all over the world, but to now see them in the comments, like, yeah, listening in from yeah. South Africa, America. And it's like, oh my gosh, like this is really going mm. global. Yeah, I think that's what I also yeah. liked about the YouTube podcast side of things is, the engagement because otherwise you don't see yeah. how people are feeling about the podcast unless they email yeah. you and that's a lot of effort yeah but now you can see the little comments yeah. and what people are liking about it and you're just like oh this is so much exactly. better <laughs> exactly the, the yeah. gratification is there so it's, it's oh, that's great. great so this is another thing we were talking about right because your podcast is called to my sisters and you are really working yeah. towards creating this sisterhood this community of women who can support each other and for me um at university that's definitely what helped me a lot and shaped me was the mm. community around me especially of women and then even now in a more professional setting again when you get female mentors who just you know are more experienced yeah. than you they always guide you better than anyone else would and what what definitely. has been your experience of you know having a community and why are you pushing to create a bigger community yeah so um I think exactly like you said, having people around you who um, can support you is so vital and pivotal. Mm -hmm. And I think as we grow up, there's not enough emphasis on how to maintain and grow and have valuable mm -hmm. friendships, not just romantic relationships, but how do you be a good friend? How do you find good friends and how can friendships impact you for the mm -hmm. better? Um, so I guess with, with my where it started for me was 
when I was 17, my mother um, unfortunately became really mm. sick. She had a blood clot in her leg. And there was a lot of like fear that it would become mm. cancerous and stuff. So she took a lot of time mm-hmm. off work. And for us, that was really stressful because she was the yeah. main breadwinner in our household. And so um, it, it brought up, obviously, on top of your parent being sick, there's now like yeah. financial strains. And like I mentioned, I was mm. working at the time, but I had taken a break to just focus on my A-levels mm. and stuff, you know working a summer job is very different to working while you're studying and only being like Mm. 15 17 so i decided you know alongside my a-levels i was going to work um and i pretty much was working full time i would go to school and right after school i would go to work and i'd be at work till 10 p.m and then come back and do my homework or revise and i was doing that repeatedly and it led to just a, a huge amount of stress um and i remember there was a day uh, in sixth form where we were in an English lesson um, and myself and Renee, we took um, a couple lessons together. So we took English and history mm-hmm. together. And so we would sit next to each other and just, Classic. you know, yeah. get through, <laughs> just get through. And um, I remember there was a day where our teacher wasn't in and we were just, you know, we had a supervisor, but the supervisor was like mm-hmm. in and out of the room. And I decided that day, I'm just not going to do my work. I think, you know, when you're so stressed that you can't even think, like you can't, you can't mm. actually function. And I was at school and I'm finding it hard to write. And all I could, I just started crying and I couldn't, like I was crying quietly. And then I got up and I ran out of the room into the toilet and I just broke Mm. down like full panic attack crying. And um, Renee and another friend ran in after me and they were like, what's going on? What's wrong? And I basically explained, I am not going to university. Like I'm going to leave those dreams aside because my mum needs me right now. And I, I need to hold this. Um, together for her and it was Renee who was there and she was just like you know what like she was there she was crying with me and she was like no you're gonna go to university because this is what you're created for and this is what you're meant to be doing your mum is gonna be okay and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure you you stop feeling like this and from then our friendship was like this like she was everything to me and I think that that moment really is the example of what the power of sisterhood can be because I was at a point where I was like I'm gonna have to make a major life decision and the stresses of life are really making me Mm -hmm. crumble but when you have a friend when you have a sister when you have somebody who understands where you're going but also is empathetic as to where you are and sympathizes with you they can remind you and help you get to where it is you need to be and in times where you're about to make bad decisions or even you know hard decisions you need community to lean on because life is not meant to be done alone and that was when and and Renee wasn't the only friend I had other friends around me who then you know really carried me through that season of my life which was probably one of the most tough situations I've been through I mean a couple months later after that I was like so anxious I was so anxious and so depressed that um, I like tried to commit suicide. And it was only my friends being like listening to me and pushing me to have these, you know, these things that I was holding Mm -hmm. in my heart and just being quiet about and locking away. They were pushing me to talk about it. And they were, they were realizing the things that I lacked and they were giving Mm -hmm. it to me and out of love, like they didn't require anything from me. And oftentimes we go seeking love in romantic Uh relationships what about the love that you get from the yeah. women around you or the people around you? Um, and are you invested enough in that? And that's where my, my passion for sisterhood kind of came. That's where my passion for sisterhood came from. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just down to like the personal impact it has had mm-hmm. on my life. And I just want everyone to experience that in good and bad times to realize that you don't have to do life mm-hmm. alone. Um, and sisterhood is a really powerful thing (laughs) yeah it's a really thank you so much for sharing all of this like this is great this is exactly why i love the sisterhood as well right it's just when you hear how impactful it can be and as you said when you're at a Mm. very important life junction and you need to choose the next path if it's just you in your head you're just like "Hmm, (laughs) i don't know yeah Um, you just Literally. need someone to take you out of your head and show you exactly what the facts are rather than you overthinking exactly. and worrying about things. And it's yeah. happened to me as well. I, I always, you know, whenever something happens, my first reaction is oh, stress. And as soon as you talk to someone else and then my friends will be like, no, but think of it this way, this way, this way. And you're like, mm, 
Actually, not mm. that bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah literally they they really yeah. get you together like it's come it's back it's really to not that bad and you're like okay cool yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with you and I think it's a wonderful job that you're doing with two of my sisters it's so cool Thank I I, I literally I, I love that you're on YouTube now and I hope people find the same thing about my podcast because every time like, I can see the facial expressions which I love right yeah <laughs> like oh yeah. great um so one thing now that we're talking about friendships you know obviously mm-hmm. we're talking about the good sides of friendships but have mm. you I know you have a video about this as well about you know um outgrowing your friends and all of that and this is something I've been experiencing recently with my upcoming fame mm. you know <laughs> it's just uh, we love yeah. to see it <laughs> it's just that there is a lot of change in attitude of people around me and some of them yeah. are actively trying to remind me that all of this is not a big deal and you know and you're just like why though <laughs> yeah. it was- yeah so have you experienced that you know in your journey from where you were to now do you feel like you've outgrown some friends and do you feel like you've actually realized who are your real friends and who are some of the Mm. you know a bit more toxic friendships Mm. yeah yeah definitely I think like you said as as you start making strides I guess um in different directions it's easy when you're you and your you become friends with people because of commonalities right and oftentimes what you have in common is your Mm -hmm. present circumstance Mm -hmm. so you know being a student or being whatever Mm -hmm. it is you know being in the same environment when you start to make transitions into new circumstances it's really interesting to see how people react because oftentimes like we can bond with people over struggle Mm -hmm. common struggle common passions um common fears common loves all of that when you now detach yourself from that what's what's the grounds for Mm. our friendship now is the other person as willing to adapt and they may not change but their thoughts towards you need to change right so I think that sometimes I've I've realized across this journey people don't want to change the way they think about you they want you to remain who you were when they met you and life doesn't remain like that we evolve in our careers we evolve in our passions our likes and our Mm -hmm. dislikes and a lot of friendships become static because people don't yeah. want to change and they don't want to accept that you've <laughs> changed. And and I, I I personally think it has been beautiful seeing people who would push you um, towards the, the positive changes mm. that you're making, um, even if it means not necessarily causing distance between you and them, but it just means that you may be different Mm. now in certain regards. And so um, I found, you know, losing a lot of my childhood friends, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, it made me realise I shouldn't feel guilty. And I think oftentimes there's a lot of guilt around it because you start to think, oh no, I'm changing, but should I be changing? Is this change actually positive if it's having quote unquote negative Mm -hmm. effect in my relationship? because you see yourself as causing yeah. resistance rather than seeing it as a natural yeah. separation that may need to happen. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been hard because friendship breakups are so they are. tough. They really like, are. Yeah. Or, or even when you just think about, oh, like I don't talk to that person yeah. anymore. And I, I hope, I hope they don't think it's because I think I'm better mm. than them. I'm or too I busy. hope they don't think it's because I'm too mm. busy or I'm now like I hope they don't see me as a bad mm. person um, and sometimes that guilt creeps in but then you also have to think but since I've been doing all this stuff what have they said to me like they haven't been supportive <laughs> they haven't they haven't chosen to be as happy about this or even like you're saying they'll choose to belittle oh, yeah. what it is mm. I'm doing And sometimes when people aren't on the same page as you, they start to think not just that you think you're better than them, but that they're doing something better than you or that what what you want to go on and pursue is not as important Mm -hmm. as your friendship Mm -hmm. with them. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what is valuable to you Mm -hmm. in this season Mm -hmm. of your life. Um, And that doesn't mean step over people and make people feel like rubbish because your career Mm -hmm. matters so much. But it's more so life is a journey and in that journey you're going to be journeying with mm-hmm. other people if some people want to dig their heels into the ground and be like i'm mm-hmm. not coming stay here fine. with me you don't yeah, have to just stay. leave them behind yeah you know and, th- and that's leave yeah. them behind and that's mm. fine they're now going to embark on their own journey and unfortunately you won't get to be a part of that but there's no reason why you should force force two things to fit together that mm-hmm. don't fit together um and as hard as it is it's a part of growing up 
Um, and I think for me, that has been one of the hardest things to embrace. I often feel very guilty mm-hmm. about it. But then the friends who truly love me and also get that they're on a journey of evolving, they oh, yeah. they're like, yeah, we're not always going yeah. to, to talk. Not every season of our friendship is going to look the same. And that's mm, okay. I agree. Yeah, you explain this so well. Because, you know, one thing that bothers me is when you see people who are meant to be very close to you, who watch everything that you're putting on, especially when you are celebrating things, and they don't message you to say congratulations or they yeah. don't acknowledge what is happening. Then I had this initial thing of, well, I won't talk about my things when we are around each other because mm, I feel like I'm I'll pushing it more. down your throat a bit now. So I will just, you yeah. know, play it cool. But then I was thinking, what's the point of having friends if you can't celebrate the, your little wins with them? This is it. You can't, you can't share each other's experiences. No. How are you going to yeah. bond? You know, you're living in yeah. the past. Like you're, you're bonding over the past versions of yourself. And it causes a lot of like, just confusion, mm. even in your own mind. Cause you're one thing when you're doing this, like you're one thing when you're recording dream girl podcast. And then you're another thing when you're exactly. with your friends. And now that difference is making you feel uncomfortable because it's, it's not integral to who you are yeah. right now. Um, and you shouldn't feel guilty about that. Evolution is inevitable. It's important. Yeah. Oh, that's that's very interesting. So another thing I wanted to talk to you about at the beginning, and I forgot, but let's bring it up now. Um, so obviously you are up. a practicing Christian, and I'm a practicing Christian. Yeah. So at uni, yes. I had varied experiences with that. A lot of questions from you know well-intentioned, curious people, and a lot of questions from people mm. who are just trying to tell me I'm wrong and very outdated, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so what was your experience of that and how did that affect your friendships? So I am very vocal mm. like about my faith and what I believe. Um, and I think everyone should be. Like I think everyone, obviously to the, gr- the degree where you mm-hmm. are comfortable, should be able to say, you know, this is yeah. what I believe in and this is what keeps me going. And, you know, and I think, Oftentimes you are in a space where people like exactly like you said, when people find out you are religious or you have a faith, you're oh, yeah. said, oh, but science <laughs> says, especially when you're in an you academic oppressed. place, but science says this, you're <laughs> oppressed. Oh, it's, it's, I understand your holy book more than you. <sighs> and it's like, you don't, you know, because I'm not crazy. No. Like, I'm not, stu- I'm I'm not, not stupid. stupid. I've made this choice. I've made this choice yeah. for a reason um but other people want to tell you what it is that you should do and unfortunately they don't realize that that's equally as oppressive it's not actually liberating mm-hmm. i've made a choice to be um a muslim or mm-hmm. i've made a choice to be a yeah. christian um you telling me i'm wrong is not liberating me it's pushing your views on me don't think that just because it's liberal mm-hmm. means it's liberating no. that's not no. the truth um, and I think that that's where it became challenging mm. because people, like you said, like, oh, that's so mm-hmm. old fashioned, it's bigoted. Have you thought of it this way? I have thought of it that way. And I have I concluded still choose on this the way. other yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's constantly that thing of people trying to prove yeah. you wrong. Espe- and what makes it more painful is this is something you hold mm. sacred. Like, this isn't just an mm. opinion. This is something that you consider to be really oh, important yeah. it, it, to it's your my human life, experience right? exactly. in life. It's changed yeah. your life, exactly, and it's a huge part of your identity. Um, so I, I did find it challenging sometimes having conversations with people who weren't Christians um, who, or who didn't have a faith, because I typically find that people of other faiths are way up yeah. like their oh, understanding, yeah. though it may not yeah. be the same, they yeah. get it. But to, to somebody who may be atheist or agnostic, it's a bit like mm. different. Um, and like I said, being in an academic place where oftentimes the the discourse that comes out against religion is coming from where you are. It's different. It's like really difficult sometimes. Like, gosh, how do you do it when like your lecturers are the people who are leading the discourse on why I your religion yeah. is wrong? <laughs> Same. And, and you know, when they come up with all the, 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 the BS of like, just trying to be devil's advocate and, me, 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 and you're just yes. like, Oh my God, just, just stop. <laughs> Stop yeah. it. <laughs> Stop. Drop it. it it's yeah, me and, but, and my life. Honestly, why do you care? D- d- why do you care? Stop it, sir. <laughs> Stop it, man. Stop. It's it's really and, and it 
it's so insidious sometimes because it's like what are you trying to push onto me like are you trying to make me hate this thing that I've been raised in or that I told dearly to my heart because you Mm. hate it or because you think there is a problem to it because there really is two sides of every coin it's not me telling you that you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong I do believe you're wrong but I'm not going to try and force you to convert Mm. to my religion that's never been my perspective but I also don't expect you to convert me to Mm -hmm. your belief and I think oftentimes people see, especially when you're in an academic place, they don't see um, even academic discourse and stuff as beliefs. Mm-hmm. They see it as yeah. fact, whereas faith is a oh, belief, yeah. right? So it almost becomes an yeah. opinion. And it's like, no, actually, I see this to mm-hmm. be fact. Now what? You know, what if I tell you that what you're saying is just an yeah. opinion? But oftentimes because it's accredited by a university or because I've got doctor in front of my name, it must yeah. be right not necessarily no and i agree with this and you know how if i was to do the same thing in the same social setting and if i start playing my agenda about why do you not believe in god you know this is why you you would be banned and then they'd be like she you would be be cancelled (laughs) you would be cancelled and but they would remove you (laughs) and yet but I have to listen to their BS and just, just defend my faith. All in, all in the name of like yeah. tolerance. And it's like, but you're intolerant <laughs> of what I believe. I'm so confused. I know. <laughs> and there's this whole debate of like, oh, you're only Muslim because you were born in a Muslim family. Yeah. Okay. As if you weren't smart enough yeah, to think you're about like, cool. it. You're like, cool. And then, and there's always this question about, okay, I, I might understand that you've had, you know, a very close interaction divine interaction and you think that god exists but why do you have this Mm. arrogance to believe that the god that you were born to you know pray is now the god as opposed to the five thousand religions that exist around the world and i was like well you go wonder i'm convinced (laughs) this is this is it like if you are on your own journey that's fine but what you're not going to do is pull me from my place to go on it with you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> why are you trying to kidnap Let's me? It. Leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> Just let me go. <laughs> Just let me go. Um, and it's cool. Like, and this is the thing. Like, oftentimes you're not even. You're not even trying to have these conversations. You may just mention I'm yeah, just I was my life. the other day, yeah. or you know, you, I, I, you just mention it in passing, and suddenly it's like, let's have a yeah. discussion and a debate. Oh yeah. No. <laughs> I just want to go and get my lunch and eat my sandwich. <laughs> Leave me alone. Usually it's just like, oh, would you like a glass of wine? No, thanks. Why? Do you not drink? No. Is it a religious reason? Yes. Oh, you're a Muslim. Do you know how many times, how many times, <laughs> how many times that has, that exact, you must get it worse, that exact scenario. Yeah. Why aren't you drinking? Yeah. Oh, so you don't drink. Why? Why don't you, don't you think that's a bit, it's not like you're going to get drunk. Jesus turned water into <laughs> you, wine. You must get that. <laughs> The words I've had enough should pop literally up right just now. Boo. I've had enough. <laughs> boo. <laughs> Thumbs down. <laughs> oh my god. I love how we can laugh about it though, because it sometimes it just pisses yeah. me off so much. A hundred percent. But you just have to, you know, it it you've got to take it with a great. Yeah, assault, and I feel like they're used and to it. At the end of the day you're used to it exactly it's unfortunate but you're used to it and I think it's great because then you get to go and laugh with your friends who have those mm. relatable um experiences and can relate and it you just laugh it off and you move on and you you go you say your prayers and you remind yourself that you're doing this yeah. for a reason and you're you like know? god by the way if you have some free time that person <laughs> <laughs> that one get, get him <laughs> <laughs> send an angel <laughs> whatever whatever you have time for i'll take it (laughs) oh my god okay so now given that you know um religion is big part does that come into play when you're choosing a life partner i know you've talked about celibacy and all of that online as well let's talk about men let's talk about men you know um yeah yeah it it does play a huge part um because i think when you you have a faith and you let that faith permeate into every part mm-hmm. of your life, the way you make decisions, the way you think about life, 
um, the way I, I mean, a, a huge part of why I work in the things that I work or why I work on the mm-hmm. things I work on is often because of my faith and like feeling like, okay, you know, God, you, you care for people and I want to do something that shows not only that I care for people too, because you've commanded me to, but because I love you and I want to do your work. And so when you find purpose in work because of faith, um, I have to then, what I feel, I need to also translate that into Mm -hmm. relationships. And I think especially from the place that having my faith means that I think about family Mm -hmm. in certain ways and the way we should um, kind of build up in a particular way. It's framed, it's especially raising children. It's framed through Mm -hmm. religion. And if you don't have that same perspective, we're definitely not Mm going to be on the Mm -hmm. same page. And so dating someone of the, because I, I always say, tell people like my religion to me, it's not just an accessory. Mm-hmm. Like it's not something that I, oh, and yeah, I'm a Christian too mm-hmm. sometimes, you know? No, it's it's actually a huge part. It's the foundational part of mm-hmm. who I am and the way, the way that I, I act. So having somebody who is on the same page as me is really important. So whether it's like the, the things like mm-hmm. celibacy and all of that, but also just how do you carry yourself? How do you make your mm-hmm. decisions? You know, how important is, honoring mm-hmm. god to you um and some people have a real problem yeah. with that yeah they do <laughs> so much oh. <laughs> the questions you get oh. it's just a bit like <laughs> why do people care so much so it's like my mum doesn't care this much about my dating life as other people do yeah you're so invested <laughs> and that's something i don't know and it's so hard right i'm like <laughs> i am ready just find me a good yeah. man who is in in touch with his feelings, who cares about God. That's all I ask for. This is all we ask, and yet sometimes it can be so difficult. It is very difficult. She, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes I'll be sitting down like every. Where are they? Where are they? Are Do they, they exist? The is the first question. <laughs> Just, the second question. I think we need to, we need to address if they that. Exist, where are they? <laughs> Where are they? I'm like, I'm like I, I am so, I'm not asking for much. Just someone who's in touch with their emotions, you know, <laughs> and who can communicate clearly how they feel. <laughs> that's yeah, all. yeah, that, that's what we're asking for. And someone who's attractive, you know, who I find attractive. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, that it becomes, it's so interesting because you, you have this desire to have a relationship, but also you want it to be with the right Absolutely. person. And I think that that's like, I always have to keep reminding myself, it only takes one. Like I believe in monogamy. Mm-hmm. So it only takes one. Like, and that's what I keep encouraging myself. Okay. Like it just takes one person. And uh, amongst all the interesting people that are in the flock currently that you, you come across, you'll find that one and that's okay. Like, give it yeah. time. You know, I think one thing that, especially when you are coming from a religious mm. background, oftentimes marriage is a huge part of yeah. your faith. Um, not yet yeah, the person, not just the person you marry, but to be yes. married. And so sometimes you feel the pressure earlier mm-hmm. than most people. Like I find my friends who aren't of a particular faith, and I think a cult. There's also cultural mm-hmm. elements of it as well. But my friends that aren't of a particular faith, or maybe you know they are Christians, but they were you know, born in the Mm -hmm. UK, they are English or whatever. They don't feel that pressure. Whereas with me, it's like, oh, you know, I need to get married and I'm 24 and I'm thinking about my husband. You guys are still thinking about boyfriend. I'm thinking about when I'm going to get these (laughs) old cracks. Like, we need to think about these things. Um, So sometimes it puts an unnecessary pressure on you as well because you're also seeing, like religious people have a tendency to get married much earlier than non-religious people. And so you kind of have that thing of, oh my gosh, time is ticking. When am Mm. I going to get, if if I'm not in a relationship by now, that means if I get in a relationship next year, it needs to be in a relationship for two years. Then we've got to get married. Then we've got to wait a year. (laughs) Before you know it, I'm 40. (laughs) You are complaining. I'm 28. I'm like, great. My my plan was to to be married by 25. I'm running three years behind on the plan. So, you know. (laughs) And it's so much unnecessary pressure. And at the end of the day, though, you just want to have something that lasts and something that makes you happy. Um, and, And, you know, that can't be rushed. And when you really do take a step back, you realize 28 is not old. 24, 25 is not old. Like, you've got time. Yeah, I'd rather wait (laughs) than, you know, just pick up anything. (laughs) I mean, if if you ever need a reminder, watch my story time. (laughs) Men out there, don't just fall for anything, babes. I love it. (laughs) They'd be crazy. But honestly, not not trashing men in general, but, you know, um, 
we were talking about high value men. So I, I listened to the podcast. My favorite yeah. topic on Let, the planet. Let's start Go with on. what is high value men? You know what's so annoying is there really is no such thing as a high value Literally. person, right? Like, the, like somebody who you could objectively look at and be like, you're worth more than the rest. Um, it depends. What are you looking at, right? Oftentimes people use like finances to mm-hmm. measure it. You know, a high value person is somebody who has a high net worth or, you know, has a high social mm-hmm. standing. Um, but oftentimes, like now in this modern day rhetoric, it's just seen as somebody who seems to be, you know, the top of mm. the pick. You know, they've got a good job there. They, they carry themselves well. Um, they haven't got kids. I mean, the bar is in mm. hell at this point. Like the bar is well past the floor. <laughs> it's, it's down yeah. there. And like, it's like, oh, they haven't got kids. They did it. And they treat people well, but they've got a confidence about them and they're athletic and they're healthy. And it's like, guys. Are you saying that everybody else who isn't these things as a man or a woman is not yeah. important or doesn't deserve mm. love? You know, and oftentimes you hear people who really push that, you know, if you're a high value man, then they need a specific kind of woman. The people who push those rhetoric are basically just using that narrative to really disrespect other mm-hmm. people and to tell people, you know, you don't fit this um You don't fit the mold of somebody who deserves to have a loving, fulfilling, um, purposeful relationship with somebody who you consider good for you. Like you, you, you aren't allowed to be attracted to the people that you're attracted to because you're not X, Y, Z. Who are you to tell me that? (sighs) It's, it's embarrassing. That's the word I've been using to describe. It's so cringe. (laughs) It's like, let people like who they like and they'll figure yeah. it out. You know, they'll figure out themselves. Why do you have to dictate to people what they can and, and cannot mm. like? Because they do not fit what you are yeah. attracted to. They don't fit your standard. It's and, and oftentimes it's so exclusionary. Like, you know, oftentimes, though they may say something um, like, oh, we just want pe- women who take care of themselves. What, what you see in their examples that they give is they want women of a certain skin shade, a certain hair type, people who uh, fit a body type. Body type. Yeah. And those who don't fit mm. into that are just... Yeah, they're off. not taking care of themselves, apparently. <laughs> they're not taking care of themselves. <laughs> You've let yourself yeah. go. Like, literally, there is this one guy who I think is the most insidious of them all. I'm not even <laughs> going to say his name. I find him actually disgusting. So... <laughs> He will, women will come out. I don't know why they keep asking him for advice, but they'll come onto his like mm-hmm. shows and stuff and ask, you know, I'm looking for a guy who, you know, just works a normal job, who is responsible. Um, yeah. And he'll be like, okay, so first of all, do you have kids? And she, they may be like, yeah, I, I have one or two mm-hmm. children. They're like, okay, how much do you weigh? And, you know, maybe she's, you know, slightly, I guess, ca- be categorized as overweight. But like, yeah, that's your problem right there. You don't deserve a good man. You don't. Like, you're punching way above your weight. Already you weigh the size of an average man. Insult upon insult upon... For what reason? Bear in mind... Sorry, I'm spilling all the tea on today's podcast. Bear in mind, this man in particular has, like, three failed marriages and kids... I wonder why. Care of. Who are you? Who... <laughs> <laughs> but honestly this does not even surprise me like boys who are our age and who are from cambridge will also say things like the only thing i want in a woman is that she is attractive and she needs to mm. not be overweight and this conversation just bugs me I, I i overheard a conversation between two boys where one of them was saying mm. i put on 15 kg over lockdown and then the other one asked, how would you feel if your fiance put on weight? And he was like, that's not acceptable. And I was like, <laughs> but where's why? logic though? Logic? <laughs> Where <is it? laughs> where's the logic? Um, but also like, wh- why is, why is, okay, fine. Fine if you want somebody who looks a certain way yeah. and attracted to something, but it doesn't mean somebody else is invaluable, oh, yeah. right? And so, it's having your partner put on an excessive amount of weight, right, yeah. or whatever you consider to be excessive, that's a different conversation in itself to anyone who is of that weight is yep. disgusting. 
or, or doesn't deserve that is that has nothing to do if you don't like it we often say this thing on the podcast you can't force yourself yeah. on anyone i can't force myself on anyone as a plus size woman i don't expect everyone to yeah. be attracted to me but i know there are people out there who will oh, be yeah. attracted to me and who yeah. are attracted to me those are the people i'm appealing mm. to the rest of you you don't go have away to yeah to just me. go away I'm not forcing <laughs> you to like me go yeah. away i just don't want you to comment on people what do you have like to have opinions about me if, right if you like what you like, like what you like, but don't like what you like because you despise the opposite. And that's what we often see, right? People use it as an opportunity to, it's that fake, and they cover it in that fake thing of, I, I just, I'm just worried about your health. You're, You're not. not worried about my health because you don't even know if I'm like smoking 16 packs <laughs> a day. You yeah. don't. You don't, you don't ask know me what I do questions. in my spare time. I might be on drugs you every don't night. Know what I do. <laughs> there you go. So it's not my health you're yeah. concerned with. <laughs> so it, it really does it really does it breaks my heart because I think it, it leads to a lot of insecurities because whether you know we, we want to kind of put, put up these fronts of we don't care about men's opinions mm. and we don't care about people's opinions all of us are going around seeking acceptance yeah. in some way and when somebody tells you that you are unacceptable mm. it does affect mm -hmm. your self-esteem it does affect the way you mm. view yourself and I want people if you are working on yourself I don't want the motive for you working on yourself to be to fuel um praise mm -hmm. from other people and to get the people who are you know fueling your in your current insecurity to approve mm. of you you shouldn't be changing yourself for approval you should be sh changing yourself because of personal mm -hmm. development and because you yeah. want to but not because you feel like oh finally you know a guy will like me i'm currently on like a health and mm -hmm. wellness journey where i'm trying to get fit and i don't want it to be fueled by because i just no. have a partner you know, it's not. It it's has because to you be want, to be, I want to be healthy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And now that we're talking about this whole, um, you know, perception of other people, another thing we've talked about before as well is the whole makeup and hair thing. And I've watched your video where you talk yeah. about this. And this is a conversation that I keep on having with Oxbridge men. And it's always mm. like, oh, I've, I've read this blog where this man is talking about how women lie when they say they, they, they don't put makeup for men because what they're doing when they're putting makeup on, this is what the blog says, um, women put makeup on because they're seeking status and status for women comes depending on their attractiveness. So therefore they are seeking status so that men would find them more attractive. And I was like, this is convoluted. First of all, why do men care? I was like, sometimes I just want, you know, sparkly eyelids. <laughs> That's all I want. I don't care what you think. And I would put that on instead of I home. want to put glitter on my yeah. eyes. <laughs> and I was like, I, I do understand that there are there is a group of women who can't go out of their house because mm -hmm. of self-esteem exactly. issues. And by us saying these things, we're not helping these women. We are making it worse for them mm. because we are we are mm. reconfirming what they already think that men will not value them if they don't have and makeup on. Fear. And and first yeah. of all, we're causing more damage <laughs> to these people who need help. And then Entirely. secondly, women like us who are more comfortable and would I would go out looking very crusty. I would have been on the podcast <laughs> looking very crusty. And sometimes <laughs> I just want to look nice because I feel better about myself mm -hmm. when I look nicer. Mm -hmm. And then they will make you question what are your motives for putting makeup on. Yeah. And I, I, I've been called yeah. out being like, oh, you talk about women empowerment, but you won't sit in front of the camera with that makeup on. And I was like, what's the correlation? <laughs> I, I, then we need to ask men, why do you get your hair cut? <laughs> why do you cut your hair? Why do you, why do you your trim face? your beard? Why, why do you have a beard? <laughs> why are you, why are you well groomed? Why are you wearing yeah. that watch? Why are you, because men get to do it in other ways, right? Men will do that hyper masculinity stuff in their mm. friendship group and then wonder why women have that same, even if it is a status thing, if women are, you know, competing with each mm. other, quote unquote, men do it even more. So why, why have you got a problem with that? Number one, because you probably think it's because we're trying to serve you yeah. and your gaze was trying to satisfy your gaze. But actually women have reclaimed a lot of things, especially the way they look. Like you said, a lot of us are happy to go out looking crusty, <laughs> dusty. We don't no. mind. Um, on top of it, our feeds are usually filled with women who, if I see somebody with an amazing eyeshadow look, I'm going to go and buy Me that palette too. and do the Me same with And my fail eyes. massively, but still try. <laughs> yeah, I tried. <laughs> 
there's a similar yes. shade, <laughs> similar tones going on, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I'm probably going to do that because I mm. like it. And I think oftentimes knowing that a woman is doing something because she mm. likes it rather than so that you mm. can like it. Sometimes men don't, they don't really get that. that. Yeah. You know? And I, they don't compute that. And I get exactly what you're saying. There are a group of women who unfortunately do feel like I, I need to do this to impress men or I need to do this yeah. for self-esteem. Um, and I think a huge part of that is the same like toxic elements of Absolutely. patriarchy that make it seem as though if you do not do these things, you are unsatisfactory. Mm. And those are the things that need to be addressed. And so I think a woman can be totally empowered by, for me, empowerment is the power yeah. to choose. Can I choose mm. for myself, you know? And and these choices I'm making, are they because of, you know, someone else is forcing me? Do I feel pressure? Or is it because I genuinely have, I, I understand what I like, what I'm interested in and what would satisfy my mm -hmm. desires. And I'm going to choose that. And not because of anyone else's opinion. And in this case, so are they saying if women stopped wearing makeup now, would it not still be the, to satisfy <laughs> men? Because a lot of women, cause if we're going to be real, a lot of women will do the whole like pixie yeah. stuff. And I, I never wear I'm, makeup. Uh, oh, My the hair's whole always thing. natural. <laughs> the whole thing. My nails are never yeah. done. Why I want to stay natural. Why? Because you think men yeah. like that. That's why you're doing that. It's not because of you. <laughs> you're not comfortable You're doing it because you want you a man to like no. you. It's, you're you're also putting yeah. on a costume. It just turns out your costume is yeah. invisible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is just so exhausting, right? This whole makeup chat, and I'm like, I don't understand. Why don't we just leave people alone? Let them do what they want to do. Why do we care what's the reason behind that lipstick? <laughs> you know just leave it be mm. but also the same people just appreciate when the you walk, when you go mm -hmm. in not wearing makeup they'll be like oh you look a bit tired today <laughs> or when you have makeup on they'll be like you look nice today what did you do different and i was like you are clearly noticing these differences and then you're telling me why do i wear these things and i was like it's the same thing as why did you shower to come into work today i needed to look room it's insanity <laughs> it's insanity <sighs> It's because a lot of, and this is one of the biggest issues I have, like, oh, women wear like too much makeup or the weaves are too long or, you, you know, leave the hair extensions alone or whatever it is. But the people who you have given the ability and maybe not men always say, but it's, it's not me. Uh, yeah. them. For example, like the people who are most famous on Instagram, the IG models, the Kim mm. Kardashians, that's what yep. they look like, you know? And those are the people who men thirst mm -hmm. over right but then you'll have an individual man be like no i don't think she's the standard of beauty okay but men collectively you have a firm that that is yeah. the look you like because those are the people mm -hmm. you go for and then when women try to make themselves look like that you're judged you're yeah. upset <laughs> it doesn't, it make, doesn't sense. make sense and these very men are the ones who will pick women who wear loads of makeup but then they will want to have in, in a social setting they want to have this conversation about why do women wear makeup it's to impress men There's so much makeup or they'll get a girl who wears makeup and then try to mold mm. her into something else yeah right and and really and truly you have to accept people um for who they yeah. are for what they like for, for who they are in their entirety people are not your personal like i always say this is not build a bear <laughs> workshop like you can't put things together you can't just pick yeah. me you can't just you know say you're in a relationship with courtney and now make courtney into somebody yeah. else or make sheen no. into somebody else that's i'm not a blank canvas i come yeah. as i come with a lot of already predetermined <laughs> things yeah <laughs> also exactly. of opinions <laughs> <laughs> exactly and don't take don't take that because if you can't handle it don't yeah find me. someone else go god yes. oh this has been lovely i i love this whole conversation <laughs> a good little rant i love we've, it we've gone past the hour by so much but this has been lovely oh, thank you so much courtney i hope you had thank fun you. Oh, thank you for having I had so <laughs> much fun. Like, I feel like I've got another yes. sister I could just like. Absolutely. So I mean, page. I've been in the system, um, but now I feel yeah. famous because I am not friends with you. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, thank you so much for having me. Like, honestly, thank you. And keep doing what you were doing, what you're doing over here, the community you're building, the messages that you're spreading as well so needed so necessary so please do keep it up please i'm so excited to just watch more of what you're going to be putting out and to see where Thank it grows you. me too i can't wait and also after lockdown we have to meet in london with renee as well 
we 100%, have to organize something 100%. and let's just meet let's in person but yeah thank you so much let's for being here today and we'll see you soon thank you bye bye